So we'll just go with Kartik, and he's going to give a presentation on mission to Alpha Centauri, and this is work he's done with Professor Carr. That's right. Okay, so with that, take it away. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Madhu Kartik Mohan Lingam, and today I'll be talking about my research work about a potential mission to the Alpha Centauri star system. So I did this work with the Space System Design Lab at Georgia Tech, the Planetary Exploration Lab, under the guidance of Professor, Professor Carr. So for some background, so far only three spacecraft have actually reached interstellar space. So these are Voyager 1, Voyager 2, and Pioneer 10. And for some context, Voyager 1 took 35 years to actually reach interstellar space. And so there are currently, there are very limited technologies that could enable fast interstellar travel. Therefore, it will take a very long time to reach interstellar space itself, and a potential mission Alpha Centauri would take thousands of years. And so we would want to see within our lifetime, like a mission that could actually go there and also extend results back. So in order to do that, we'll have to develop new technologies. And so industrial missions would be very beneficial because they could enable key scientific discoveries and expand the technological capabilities of humanity as a whole as well. So the key destination would be Alpha Centauri because it is the closest star system to us. So there are a lot of benefits of interstellar missions. So first we could learn a lot of scientific, gain a lot of scientific knowledge by sending a mission to interstellar space. For example, the search for extraterrestrial life, so, so life elsewhere in the universe other than our home planet Earth. And then we can learn more about the formation, evolution, system composition, and processes of various star systems, stars, planets, and the universe as a whole. And we could use this knowledge and apply it to our own star system, our own system and learn more about ourselves and all the overall universe. Uh, additionally, there's a lot of uh, like precursor missions we could do, or like on the way to Alpha Centauri, for example. Uh, for example, we could learn more about a lot of enigmatic and intriguing areas of the universe that are near our source, such as Oud Cloud, Kuiper Belt, and Hypothetical Planet X. And uh, some other benefits are just the development of advanced technologies, which could um, propel mankind as a whole and improve the uh, capabilities of humanity, and also spin off technologies which could all potentially be used for everyday civilian use on Earth. So why Alpha Centauri? Alpha Centauri is the closest star system to us at 4.367 light years away. So Alpha Centauri also contains the closest star, uh, Proxima Centauri, and the closest exoplanet, Proxima Centauri B. Um, so it's actually a three star system. So there's uh, with three stars, so Alpha Centauri A, B, and Proxima Centauri. And then of these stars, Proxima Centauri specifically has three exoplanets, uh, Proxima Centauri B, C, and D. Of these exoplanets, Proxima Centauri B is a very key science this nation because it is located within the habitable zone of the Proxima Centauri star. Therefore, it may contain liquid water because there, there might be suitable temperatures and conditions to sustain water. And as a result, there could the planet potentially could host extraterrestrial life since water is a key ingredient for life and life as we know it. And that's what we would look for first in any other body. So that is why Alpha Centauri is a very intriguing target for interstellar travel. So just reaching the star, this is just a diagram showing everything we have to go through in order to reach the stars. For example, we'll get to go through the entire solar system and actually study our solar system itself. Like we all, there's a lot of part, a lot of parts of the solar system that we actually don't even know that much about still. So a mission to Alpha Centauri or precursor missions could enable us to learn more about our own solar system and then near our solar system, such as like the Kuiper Belt, Termination Shock, Heliopause areas and then the Earth cloud and the interstellar medium in general before we actually arrive at our key destination. So th this provides ample research opportunities for learning more about our surroundings and the universe as a whole, in addition to the Alpha Centauri star system. So there are a lot of requirements that have to be met in order to enable such an interstellar mission. So first, there are propulsion requirements. So currently, the record spacecraft speed is held by the Parker Solar Probe, which uh, traveled at 0.067% the speed of light. And this was with chemical propulsion. But for interstellar travel, we would need faster spacecraft. Because if we want to reach, uh, for example, Alpha Centauri in reasonable time frame, so by reasonable time frame, I mean like within our generations or within our lifetime. So like a course of decades, hope, ideally, we would want to develop new types of propulsion methods and new types of enabling technologies. So today's propulsion, propulsion methods are definitely not uh, ideal for this because chemical propulsion would result in a 70,000 year trip time while electric propulsion, so like ion or hull thrusters, could, put, could result in a 10,000 year um, trip time to Alpha Centauri. 
Therefore, we need to develop new types of propulsion methods, and there have been a lot of proposals, which we'll look into. But some of the key requirements include ISP or specific impulse requirements. So if we want to, so if we want to reach 0.1 C or 0.1 of the speed of light, we would have to have a value of ISP of 400,000 seconds. So this is just a lower um, target. So we would ideally want to go at like 0.2 C to enable a 20 year mission uh, to Alpha Centauri, but we want very high ISP and high space for, uh, spacecraft acceleration values. So ISP or specific impulse is actually the measure of how efficiently a system or engine actually utilizes its propellant to produce thrust. And so that's why we want very high values of those. If we look into more specifics, this is just a chart compare, a diagram comparing various propulsion methods that exist or have been proposed. So as you can see, current propulsion technologies are all within the regime that does not, would not, not enable interstellar propulsion as we know it as an hour least. The only, th the only three actual propulsion methods are within the zone, with the, are above the special minimum just the impulse of 400,000 seconds. So these would be sails or solar light sails and then nuclear fusion and antimatter. So these are three um, propulsion methods that could potentially enable interstellar propulsion. So this table is just comparing propulsion methods again, but so we have, we talk about the propul various propulsion concepts that exist or have been proposed, the TRL or technology readiness levels, and a brief description of them and their applicability to interstellar missions. The first, the highest TRL of nine are the current technologies we use, such as chemical propulsion and solar electric propulsion. But these are both limited because of energy density and solar power range limits. Therefore, we cannot apply these to interstellar emissions. Then there's solar sails, nuclear electric propulsion, and nuclear thermal propulsion, all of which have a TRL of less than four. And these are also not ideal because they're, again, like energy density limited, solar power is limited, or acceleration. So these would not be ideal to use for interstellar applications. The last three propulsion propulsion methods listed here, so nuclear fusion, antimatter annihilation, and laser light sails, have extremely low TRLs of less than equal to two. But they are applicable to initial health because they meet the ISP requirements and energy density requirements. Um, so basically, we'll go a little more deeper into these. So again, the applicable proportion methods. So laser light sales. This uh, laser light sales are a relatively new concept that has been proposed, but they're being studied extensively by the Breakthrough Starshot project. So uh, experts predict that laser light sails could enable a spacecraft to travel at a velocity of 0.2 C or 0.2 times speed of light and, and allow for a trip time of only 20 years to Alpha Centauri star system. Uh, of course, there are some constraints on payload. So it has to be a one gram payload if this has to happen. So that would be very, that was a challenging thing to me, but this is very promising technology because this is actually based off of um, existing technology because light sails already exist, but they're in the form of solar sails. Solar sails basically use the radiation pressure exerted by the sun to propel the spacecraft. So they propel like sails attached to spacecraft. And so it's like, the, basically it's like spacecraft cruising or sailing through space. So think of it as like a, a sailboat on the ocean. It's like the wind is the pressure that's um, hitting the sail and it's causing the sail, a sailboat to move throughout the ocean and sail through the ocean. So it's a similar thing, except it's sailing through space. The laser light sails are similar, except they don't use solar. Um, they don't use the sun's radiation pressure. They use, they would be using an, the power from lasers, like a laser array on Earth. So that is a very interesting concept that has been proposed and is being worked on. There's also nuclear pulse or nuclear fusion propulsion. So like Project Longshot, Project Orion from the 80s are some projects that looked into these. And there's been, there hasn't been that much research now because it's a very controversial topic since you're basically using nuclear explosions kind of to propel the spacecraft. But this, there are a lot, there are some, um, advanced, there's some like benefits to using this because you have high thrust and high specific impulse values and you can carry a payload of up to 30 tons. Um, the velocity would be lower, you would reach like 0.045 the speed of light and shift time would be higher than this, it would be 100 years. But that's still relatively, um, that's still relatively short if you think of it like in a cosmic time. So therefore this is another option, but I guess if payload doesn't matter and if we can minimize payload uh, masses, we can potentially, we could use laser light sails. But if we payload matters a lot and we don't care about time as much. We could use nuclear fusion propulsion potentially in the future, but that's still something for the future. The final concept here is called antimatter annihilation. This basically uses the interaction of matter and antimatter so that causes annihilation and produces high energy photons such as gamma rays. And this is used as propulsion to propel spacecraft. 
and this is a very futuristic concept still. There's been very limited like research actually done into this, but this has the highest energy density. Um, this why being, but it's super expensive and hard to produce and store. So this is a very futuristic technology that we cannot, uh, we can't count on yet, but hopefully it's something in the future that will become big. But right now we're gonna focus a little more on laser light cells because of their potential applicability and uh, their TRO values are, I think will be high pretty soon. Well, again, laser light cells, they use the radiation pressure from high energy laser beam arrays on the ground, so on Earth. And then the, basically the ground-based array would form a single beam with a power of on the scale of 100 gigawatts. And uh, laser beams would be directed onto highly reflective, large, lightweight sails, or also light sails, which would be attached to a nanocraft, which are like super tiny spacecraft. And by doing this, it will basically blast the spacecraft into to relativistic speed. So like ideally like 0.1 or 0.2 that's times the speed of light. And so nanocraft would have the nanocraft would have to have payload constraint to a one gram size wafer, as I mentioned earlier. So that is one restriction that has to be placed on it in order to achieve the speeds we want. And but experts predict again that this could this method could enable velocities up to 20% speed of light, and this could result in travel time of only 20 years to Alpha Centauri. So this is a very promising method that we should definitely look into more and is being looked into. Um, just as a side note, there's some other propulsive maneuvers that are typically used by spacecraft. So these aren't necessarily propulsion methods, but these are just maneuver, orbital mechanic orbital maneuvers. So for example, a Jupiter gravity assist or a flyby of Jupiter or any other planets, for example, are is when like you would utilize the movement and gravity of a planet, so in this case Jupiter, to gain a large velocity. So for example, the Voyager spacecraft um, you did this. They used a flyby of Jupiter to gain access to the entire solar system and ultimately reach an orbital space. So that's one maneuver that potentially could be used for spacecraft to reach initial space. There's also a solar overth maneuver, which is basically, which is also known as a powered flyby, because you would gain velocity by fall, the spacecraft would gain velocity by falling into the sun's gravitational well and then firing engines. So this causes a much higher delta V than a lower change of velocity. So there's a higher velocity the spacecraft gains. So basically, both these maneuvers basically make use of taking, they basically take away some of the momentum from the planets themselves, but it's so minor that it doesn't really count as anything. But in this case, since the spacecrafts are so much less like weight-wise, like they'll be able to gain a very large delta V. But the issue with these maneuvers is that they're limited to about 20 AU or strong units per year, but we would ideally want over 600 per year to enable at least a 0.1C um, spacecraft mission. So that's why these are not ideal, or these alone or in combinations with each other would not be ideal for to um, allow for very fast interstellar transit. So against some enabling technologies, well, like uh, we would need a gigawatt class laser array on ground or in space, and then we would want like long lived nan nanocraft in order to figure out if we can actually, because we would want to actually have like high mission, large mission durations, and we want to prepare for that. Uh, we also need a dramatic decrease in the size of micro electronic components, the electronic components. So for the payload, for example, we want the cameras, the EPS, um, the ADCS, any other systems that spacecraft needs. To be miniaturized so that they can fit in for if we use laser light cells, so they can be fit within a one van payload. Um, an interesting concept, so the picture over here is from the Breakthrough Starship project. So they're trying to work on something called Starship, which will basically that would be like a wafer, a gram sized wafer tip, which would contain all the necessary components and systems for a spacecraft to function successfully for the years on end. And another thing is that we have developed instrumentation on the ship scale. So, for example, if we want to study the plan, so for life detection, if you want to do spectroscopy, we could use chip scale life detection methods instead of like using like any bigger instrumentation. So that would be another requirement that we would have to work with. And of course, we'd have to figure out materials capable of withstanding the radiation, lasers, relative speeds, and in a sort of medium in general. So, so far we've been looking at how we can actually reach Alpha Centauri, Centauri but we should also talk about how, what happens when we arrive there. So if we're traveling at relative speed, so as, as per a fraction of speed of light, we could only do a flyby mission of the system. So this was limited research that can actually be done there. So we ideally want to slow down because if we're going that fast, we might not be able to capture images as, as successfully or clearly. So there might be issues with like the instruments, resolution, accuracy, position of the measurement of all the instruments that are on there. So we ideally want to decelerate, but we don't want to use like typical retro rockets because that would mean we have to carry an extra payload there. And we don't want to, we were trying to minimize mass for this case. So that's why we would want to figure out different methods. So there have been a lot of interesting methods proposed for these. So these are some of the top methods uh, that are most um, 
likely or they have like a higher possibility of happening potentially soon. But basically, the ideas are one would be a hybrid magnetic and electric tail concept in which we would use the which the spacecraft basically would use the magnetic and electric fields in a certain medium to deflect the trajectories of incoming ions, and this would be a, allow it to reduce the spacecraft speed. Speed. However, this is a process that would take up like 29 years. If we're of course this is if we're traveling at like 0.5 c. So if we're traveling slower, this will take less time. But regardless, it will be on the scale of like decades. Um, for at least years, which is not ideal for because it's just adding more and more to our mission time. But another option is a photogravitational assist, which is a very new concept as well. But this would utilize the this is where the spacecraft utilizes the radiation and gravity of the stars in the Alpha Centauri system itself um, to slow down. So basically, it'll use the photon pressures pressures of the three stars uh, together to, and along with gravity assist to decelerate. But this is a process that's even slower; it would take 50 years, potentially take 50 years. So both these processes, processes would take uh, a decent amount of time to happen. So we would want to ideally optimize these so they make their slower. So we want to come with potential methods of making these methods faster, so we don't have to spend too much time on deceleration. But antimatter is one last case that has been last thing um, proposal has been made, but there's very limited studies done on this, and so we can't really go into that as much until we know more. But there are a lot of near-term benefits. Of inner solar travel, so we'll go into those um, specifically on the next couple of few slides. So first, we'll if we develop like the technology necessary for to allow fast inner solar transit to Alpha Centauri, this will allow us to potentially get get faster, efficient access to our own solar system. So right now, it takes like nine months to get to Mars. It'll take it takes years to get to outer planets. So instead, like if we're able to develop the technologies necessary to, to allow very fast inner solar travel, we could facilitate access to astronomical bodies within our own solar system. Um, so we'll have faster speeds and lower travel times, which means we can go to different places quickly and do scientific study, or like uh, if we want to do a settlement, for example, somewhere, or resource collection, or any uh, anything like that, we could do it very quickly uh, in the future. And also, this would also be good. Like precursor missions could also be sent within our solar system to validate the concept of like laser light cells, for example, because we can do initial testing with like different speeds, different acceleration methods, different uh, deceleration methods, and everything. With the different systems and try to figure out what's optimal for initial travel as well. So there's a lot of stuff that can be done within our solar system and near our solar system if we use this. Um, so next, another potential benefit is visiting inner solar objects that have come into our solar system. So, so far, there have been um, two um, key inner solar objects that have been identified. So Omoma and Borisov, the common Borisov. Both of these are supposed to be you know, stellar objects and so it, potentially, we could send missions to these objects because if we use the new propulsion technologies and the new enabling technologies, and these these will be important because we can learn more about inner solar, inner solar space in general and the star system that these um, objects originate from. So these could also be precursor missions. Another interesting concept is like Mars package transport because there's a lot of talk about settling, doing settlements on Mars, doing research on Mars, sending astronauts to Mars. So it'd be interesting, like if there's like an issue where, so if you want to facilitate this, one option is to use this kind of new technologies because if there are people sell there, if any issues arise, like we could easily fix it by sending stuff to them to Mars by using like this uh, method of Mars package transport, uh, which we'll discuss in the next few slides real quick briefly. But basically, the idea would be rapid transit, like a rapid transit system between Earth and Mars. So this would facilitate the creation of infrastructure on Mars and facilitates human settlement. And we could also assure that there's no the astronauts or sellers there aren't completely independent, as like uh, instead like we'd be able to like send supplies like within a reasonable time frame, ideally within like weeks uh, instead of like nine months, ten months as it is now. And rapid high value like low mass cargo could be potentially transported as needed. So if we want to like build infrastructure here, this would be an easy way of doing so. So there's actually been some studies done into this already. Like laser enabled 45 day Mars missions with like a one ton payload has have been studied. And so, of course, since it's only Mars, like delta Vs don't be, need to be as high and there'll be less laser power required when can we compare this to like inner solar travel. But the goal would be like uh, this goal was like a 45 day mission where there's like a launch phase, then there's a boost phase in which they use a laser array focused on to a collector attached to a spacecraft to enable laser thermal propulsion. And there'll be a boost phase, so that's the boost phase, and then there'll be like a hyperbolic Earth escape trajectory to Mars, and deceleration Mars with like aero capture, air braking. 
So this is a concept that's already been proposed and there's a, some other studies that have been doing similar to this that are being done. But our specific proposal study for this would be, so this could be a precursor mission again, or like an application of this technology, but just using similar trajectory analysis as the Duplay paper, that's what this last slide was based on. But this, our idea is basically doing like a bi-directional laser acceleration, deceleration mechanism, where if there's any necessity to get some objects to Mars or Earth, anything, like we could just boost, do a boost phase from here with like laser ray, and then within like, ideally within like 20 days, we would also have like a scaling of the payload down to like smaller mass, less than 110. And ideally we could have rapid transfer time of like 20 days or so. So we could like simple go there within 20 days and then deliver everything. And then also potentially install a laser array there for deceleration purposes and for acceleration back, like for example, samples from Mars to Earth. We could also like um, enable that to happen. So this is one potential application of such technologies. And again, just like there's a lot of innovative and improved technologies that can be developed. So as benefits, like dramatic smaller components, for example, like the Starship concept I'm talking about, like if we can uh, make like a small chip with all of the necessary components within it, this could be used for every civilian use, for example, like computers, laptops, or like any other small technologies and gadgetry. We could use it for those applications. Also stronger, more robust materials. That's also something everyone could use on Earth. And just in general, like faster space travel and efficient methods of deceleration are very useful for other space applications, space missions. Uh, some other potential benefits include like just the opportunity for more missions to be proposed. Like if we have better technologies, more interesting and relevant missions can be proposed. And also like potential research collection. I know there's like a lot of there's a lot of talk about like mining from other places. Like uh, if the, if we need to if you want to do that in the future, for example, you could potentially use such a system to like do rapid transit back and forth. Also asteroid defense. Like if there's an asteroid or like hazardous object coming towards Earth and it might hit us, like we could potentially use this mission, like use this to, to send a mission that will like quickly deflect it or like change the trajectory so that we don't have to deal with that. Um, also orbital debris removal is another interesting application. For example, if we have a laser array on Earth, there's like a lot of traffic now in low Earth orbit and it's like uh, poses a danger to satellites in low Earth orbit, for example, and, and in lower orbit in general as well. So potentially we could use lasers to even like zap the debris or like any old components out or old like like dysfunctional like um, spacecraft out of the orbit. And this could potentially help with space situation awareness. But some cons quick considerations are geopolitical considerations because the only, some of the issues with nuclear propulsion and the laser light sails is that we would want to build a ground-based laser array. And this could potentially be used for like targeting or Earth orbiting satellites. So this is something that could be, if it goes in wrong hands or if there's some issue with it, this is some issue that could present itself. And also like a space-based laser array could be used to target Earth, which is another issue, like we don't want that to happen either. Nuclear explosions as propulsion is also a very controversial topic. That's something that a lot of people ideally don't want to see. So these are some considerations, but a solution could potentially be to have the laser ray, like if we gain more access to the moon, if we have it on the far side of the moon, there's no way of the laser ray to be aimed towards Earth. So we won't be able to actually hit Earth like no one could be able to use it for hitting Earth or hitting Earth or being satellites. It would only be used for like boosting the spacecraft to relative to speeds. So that's one potential solution. But overall, we just need world cooperation to enable this and any other such. So, um, then so in conclusion, this is a very ongoing. Is this still an ongoing process, pro like project? So it's very early in the process. But we're confident that we can see such technologies in our lifetimes. So I hope everyone is excited for the possibilities that the future holds. And I truly do believe if we all work, work together as a world, we, we can truly reach the stars. Uh, thank you. And are there any questions? Yeah. What inspired you to? Yes, yeah, so Alpha Centauri is like the closest star system to us. So if we want to do interstellar travel, like this is a key destination because this also has the closest star, Proxima Centauri, and the closest exoplanet. It's called Proxima Centauri B. And so it's in the habitable zone of its star, which means there's potential for water there and potential for like extraterrestrial life there. So that's one of the key, like it's like a very, it would be very like scientifically like groundbreaking kind the of mission there. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that solar sails were eliminated by the distance from the sun. Yeah. Would that not also be true with laser sails? Because that too would be eliminated by the distance from the earth. 
Yeah, so the thing is, like, solar cells won't be able to provide as much acceleration as laser light cells. So if you were to use, like, a gigawatt, like, 100 gigawatts of, like, laser power, like, directed onto, like, a scale concentrated, that's going to provide much more, like, of a boost than, like, just solar cells, solar radiation pressures. How is that factor? Yeah, so I, that was something we didn't look into as much yet, but that's something that definitely needs to be worked on. Like, there's, of course, a lot of technologies that need to be developed. So communications is definitely one. And the control. Uh, no. Oh, okay. Cool. Any other questions? Nothing online, so <clears throat> next one. Okay, thank thanks. you. So the next presentation is by Tim Chow. This is work you did with Professor Ramoli. Ramoli, yeah. right? Um, on development of soft tensegrity Tenseg systems for space structures and planetary exploration. So with that, go away, Tim. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ramoli. So this presentation will discuss the development of tensegrity structures and their potential applications for rovers and larger space structures. I did this research under Dr. Amoli under the Computational Solid Mechanics Lab, specifically for the tensegrity team. So for a general outline, I will first go through an introduction of what tensegrity is and why we want to develop tensegrity structures, why they are useful. I'll then dive into an experimental rover tensegrity design that has been developed for the past few years by about, I believe, 20 members. And then I'll shift focus a little bit onto our current project, which revolves around upscaling the structures for larger as applications in space. All right, so let's first start off by asking ourselves, what is tensegrity? The term itself is just a combination of the words tensional integrity, but what does that in itself mean? So a tensegrity structure at its core is composed of both tension and compression elements. However, it is unique from most other structures because the compression elements are isolated and discontinuous from one another. They do not touch each other, as seen in the diagram. Now, these continuous, this continuous elements are held together within an outer shell, the continuous tensile network, which, and that provides the stability and integrity for those compression elements, along with the entire structure in general, which is why we have the term tensional integrity. Now, as stated before, the compression elements are isolated and do not impact the stability of the overall structure. That stability is solely from the tension elements. Now, that makes tensegrity structures really unique because normally compression plays a crucial role in determining the stability and integrity of a structure. So to understand why a configuration that relies only on tension elements for stability, why it's important, we need to particularly look into the case of buckling. When a normal rigid structure, such as a bar, a column, or a truss buckles under a large compressive load, that would usually indicate failure. For example, if you had a large concrete column of a bridge buckle, that would be very catastrophic, and there would be lots of property damage and potential lives lost. Now, buckling doesn't necessarily equal failure in the case of the tensegrity unit. In fact, in certain cases, it may actually be beneficial for certain applications. Now, the reason why is that rigid structures want to limit their loading to the triangular region, as shown on the graph. Uh, buckling occurs when the bar in the graph becomes horizontal. For consecutive structures, they do not fail under buckling, so therefore they're, under, they're able to utilize a much larger portion of the graph and store large amounts of elastic potential energy. That elastic potential energy can be converted into kinetic energy for use in motion or, for an example, a rover integrity system. All right. Before diving into the specifics of applications, let us first take a closer look at a single tensegrity unit. All of the units that we design here in the lab are prototypes, and as such, the materials required for assembling and constructing a unit are relatively easy to obtain through online vendors. And most components are built by hand, and occasionally we ask for some assistance from the machine shop or the makerspace if needed. Now, a single tensegrity unit is composed of three main elements. 
the, for the tensile elements, we have uh, cables with steel cables with two screws on each end. And then for the compressive elements, we have carbon fiber bars. And we also have cable connectors that connect the tension and compression elements together. We also call those nodes. And how it works is essentially we have screws from the tension elements of the cables, and those screw into some of the posts onto the nodes. And the nodes also have a larger ball joint area where the ball goes in. And there's also a hollow cylinder on the other end, and that's where the bars, the compressive bars fit in. Now, in some cases, we also need an actuator or a motor, which connects and hangs within a unit and mechanically compresses it whenever we need uh, elastic potential energy. All right, so for the rover concept, conceptually, consecutive structures have potential for use in space exploration as rovers. Their ability to deform and store large amounts of potential energy is perfect for protecting the payload from fast and heavy impacts during landing. The stored potential energy can also be converted to kinetic energy for the rover to utilize and move around its environment. And this motion is usually achieved through a flip maneuver. So the image here shows a simulation of how a four unit structure would conduct the flip. Some units would compress and then release, launching the rover into the air and landing a certain distance away. The direction of motion can be dependent on which units are compressed and released at a time. Now, an actual rover designed to be implemented would ideally want to be at least eight units, two by two by two cubic lattice structure, that ensures that any payload that it carries is relatively safe in the center of the cube. However, a rover does not need to be limited to just eight units. There can be tens or even hundreds of units depending on how large you want the application to be and what kind of payload you are carrying. All right, so with an overview of, overview of the rover design explained, now let's discuss the different types of motion and actuation within every unit within a rover. So the four main categories include passive compression, active compression, passive release, active release. And I'll go into more detail in the next slides. But essentially, passive motion is influenced usually by the outside environment and is harder to directly control, while active motion would be controlled by a motor and allows us for, allows for more finer and refined control. Here are a few GIFs, uh, passive and active compression. So passive compression occurs when a unit is compressed by an outside force and it stays compressed. So while in the lab, we would simulate this by manually compressing a unit by hand shown by the drip on the left. But in a mission, this, should usually, this would usually be achieved by falling from a lander or another higher elevation and hitting the ground and impacting it. And when it impacts the ground, it usually stays compressed. And it stays compressed through a ratchet mechanism and a constant force spring. The constant force spring spools up a string that is connected to two sides of the unit in order to compress it. And the ratchet essentially restricts the unit's ability to expand once it has been compressed. Active compression, shown on the right, is a similar process with the ratchet and the spooled string, as mentioned before. But now the constant force spring is instead replaced with a motor and the entire system within the motor housing. Now, as shown, uh, the motor can control the speed and amount of compression on a unit, which is useful when we want to control how much compression there is, how far a unit can maneuver. Now for passive and active release. Uh, passive release shown on the left is the uncontrolled release of all of the elastic potential energy that is stored in the bars. It occurs when you unlock the ratchet mechanism, which unspools the string and allows the compressed unit to, revert, to revert back to its original neutral position all at once. That usually occurs with a jump. Active release would be the slow release of a compressed unit without any jumping, which is useful in a few select cases such as when decompressing the unit immediately after it lands, and therefore we don't induce any large unnecessary releases of energy to cause any unwanted motion of the rover. Now, active release has not yet been engineered by the research team, but a reverse drift of a unit undergoing active compression shows what active release would look like once it has been achieved. So for a few tests that we can conduct at this point, with the current motor housing design configuration, we can perform controlled maneuvers using active compression, passive release. The first type would be a jump with a single unit, which involves actively compressing a single unit 
and passively releasing it all at once, resulting in a jump as the unit springs back. In the previous slide, this can be shown with the passive release on the left, the jump maneuver. Now, the second type involves a flip, which is usually with two or more units. Now, one unit is, act or like in this case, one unit is actively compressed and then passively released, which causes a jump that flips the entire structure 180 degrees in a flip motion. That's how the rover would move around by doing a whole bunch of flips. Okay, so a few issues that we have encountered. Hmm. So some of these issues ended up being resolved, but others remain for further troubleshooting. So one issue is that the active compression of the unit was initially relatively slow, it would take upwards of 60 seconds to fully compress. Uh, ideally, this compression time should be reduced to allow for more efficient maneuvering. And a potential fix would be to use a more powerful motor and batteries, which is what we ended up doing. And this ended up working to an extent with the compression with the current design, taking around 15 to 20 seconds to fully compress. Uh, this is more ideal, but further improvements can still be made if we need to compress the unit even faster. Now, there is also the issue of motor housing slamming. So the initial position of the motor housing was near the top of the unit, and that puts the motor at risk of slamming into the ground after a successful flip, because then it the bottom of the unit. But to prevent slamming, the housing was repositioned to be near the center of the unit. But for that, we would need biaxial compression, which means that the string would have to be spooled from both ends, the top and the bottom, or in the past, when the unit when the motor was on top, it would only spool from the bottom. Now, using biaxial compression puts a lot more load on the motors, but with the improved hardware that we had from before, improved the compression time, this ended up benefiting well, and the new hardware ended up holding up. There's also the issue of motor house jiggle, and which is essentially saying that the motor housing tends to shake after a successful flip or unsuccessful. This erratic behavior essentially uses up some of the stored potential energy within the bars, and it leaves less for the actual flip, which reduces the amount of motion that we would want to achieve. To remove any shaking, we would have to find a way to stabilize the motor housing in the center of the unit, without fundamentally affecting the actual structure itself. And then lastly, as shown by the drift here, uh, when we're attempting to flip maneuver for a larger four unit structures, there are issues involved in getting multiple units to simultaneously compress. Uh, flipping larger structures involves the compression and release of multiple units at once, to generate enough kinetic energy and move a heavier structure. So both ratchets for the compressed units were commanded to release at the same time, but there are still delays between the two, resulting in insufficient amounts of energy in a single moment that are necessary for a flip. So the delay here shown in the GIF was about four seconds. Now attempts were made to try to get rid of the delay by using a single master microcontroller to command multiple units at once. So far, like they, we have we have we've been having trouble getting them to like release like absolutely simultaneously. We've managed to like reduce the delay, but even with like a one second delay, there wouldn't be enough energy for the actual flip maneuver. It would have to be like perfectly synchronous. And we haven't had success with that so far. All right, so let's just focus to our current project which regards the upscaling of the note of the units. So another potential application of tensegrity is for use in larger space or planetary infrastructure, such as with satellites or habitats. Now this is due to several advantages. First, the bar elements provide a lot of stiffness for each unit in order to withstand large loads. The cables provide a lot of stability. The structure itself is also relatively low density because a single unit is really lightweight compared to the amount of volume that it takes up. There, there is also high storage efficiency and it is easier to deploy compared to conventional truss structure. As shown in the diagram, uh, an ultra large infrastructure of tens or even hundreds of units can all be connected, compressed, stacked on one another into a relatively compact space within a payload fairing, for instance. That would greatly reduce the launch cost for a mission. And after the payload is deployed, all of the units would release and automatically assume the relevant structure needed, depending on how they were connected before launch. So with that said, the current stage of the project involves upscaling the units. The diameter of a single unit that we used for the rover, about 
20 inches in diameter or 0.5 meters. Our current goal is to upscale a single unit to be about 1.5 meters in diameter. It's three times the size. All right, so scaling up a unit requires a couple of design changes with the nodes, the cables, and the bars. The cables clearly need to be lengthened to accommodate for the increased size. How would the nodes need to be? The general arrangement of all of the posts on a node would remain the same because the orientation of all of the bars and the cables is unchanged. The only thing that really changes is the distance. Mm. The main aspect of the nodes that we would want to change would be to reduce their thickness by essentially flattening them. Uh, with the previous node design shown on the left, this would involve reducing the large spherical vertex area that is covered in tape, which is where all of the posts combine, merge. Now, flattening the nodes is desirable mainly because we want to reduce the compression ratio of a unit. That is the ratio of the height of a compressed unit over the height of an uncompressed unit. A smaller compression ratio essentially allows a single unit to take up less space and all compressed, which allows for more units to be fit within a payload for storage and thus larger structures as well. All right, so now for the bars. The compressive carbon fiber bars also need to be modified. In addition to lengthening the bars, the stiffness must also be increased, not only to withstand the external loads, but also to maintain the weight of the integrity structure itself without buckling. So essentially, you don't want it to buckle under its own weight. Uh, with a multitude of larger units present in a larger structure, weight becomes a much bigger issue compared to a smaller unit configuration with a rover. So to increase the stiffness usually involves using thicker bars or increasing the thickness by attaching additional bars around the main bar. There's also the consideration to use hollow bars as well. Now to determine the stiffness from a mathematical standpoint, we, need, we would need to find the buckling load P critical that a unit can withstand and use that value as a baseline to compare to. Uh, with the critical load equation, P critical equals pi squared times EI over L squared. Uh, where E is the elastic modulus, we have I as the second moment of inertia for the cross-section area of the bars, and L is the length of the bar. And then after we find P critical, it then needs to be adjusted for an angle in which it is positioned, because the bars are mostly diagonal. And that involves multiplying the sine of the angle. And we also need to multiply them by four, because usually there are four bars that are facing direct compression at one time. And also for weight reduction, a few other minor design changes with the overall structure were considered to reduce weight as much as possible. Uh, one aspect of weight reduction involved using shorter screws. So the motivation for that was that the maximum thread engagement that you want for a typical screw is 1.5 times the diameter of the screw. And our current screws that we were using before uh, had a bunch of extra threads that weren't necessarily needed to keep the nodes and cables together. There's also the risk that if you have too much screw engagement, then you would want there would be unwanted binding between the nodes and the cables. It'd be very difficult to remove if you wanted to. Okay, so as mentioned before, flattening the nodes would also reduce weight. Another option is that we can use that extra material and allocate it elsewhere onto the node to make it more stable. The main choice for that was to add fillets between the posts. And the reason for that is because the posts were the most common failure point whenever testing. Whenever something would break, it would most often be with the nodes. And on the nodes, it would often be the posts that would break because of excess non-axial loads. So the use of the shorter screws also allows the posts to be shortened further, further improve the rigidity and sturdiness of the overall node design. Now, something that we explored last semester was also the concept of multi-node cable runs. It involved running, multiple, running cables through multiple nodes in a square region without the need for screws in certain posts. And there'd be a mid-cable tensioner in between that would act to achieve the tensile integrity from before. So this design was interesting because it would further decrease the post length and keep the nodes even sturdier. But it was found that mid-cable tensioner reduced the stability of the overall tensile network, so this design was not implemented in the end. All right. So for our current goal for this semester, we want to build at least one prototype 1.5 meter unit 
to establish a proof of concept that the unit can still compress normally for its own weight. A second unit can then be built, stacked on top to verify that the units at the bottom can withstand the weight of multiple units. And then from there, the general direction involves increasing the number of units to at least eight to hold a large payload and a cube arrangement, and then increasing the number further to a two by two by four lattice with two cubes stacked on top of each other, simulate a relatively large structure. Now, prototypes need to be developed and tested first before a unit comprised of more durable materials and metal nodes would be used for an actual mission. Now, an important added note is that node sizes and cable thicknesses remain relatively similar. Currently, when we are tripling the size to a 1.5 meter unit, if the unit were to be increased even further, we might need larger nodes and thicker cables. Thicker cables are necessary because we need to keep the larger tensile network together. And the larger nodes are necessary mostly to ensure that the bars have enough degree of freedom to actually compress completely. And this degree of motion is usually influenced by the ball joint area where the carbon bars fit in, connect with the nodes and the tensile network. As the bars get thicker, the hollow end of the ball joint also gets thicker because that's where the bars fit in. And if it gets to the point where the area becomes too thick, then there isn't as much area for the ball to, joint to actually rotate. So then we would actually need to increase everything. And if we were using a smaller ball joint area, there's also the risk that a thinner neck would snap with an additional load from a larger unit. All right, so this includes most of my presentation. There are a lot of different aspects of this project that I can cover in detail, ranging from the design, construction, assembly, and testing. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. So uh, there is, we do have like a camera Vicon software, which before like all the nodes have like reflective tape on there. And then we would use that software to simulate the motion of like every node is like a single point. And there's also, I believe, standard FEA software when we're testing the loads that a unit would experience. So it's more of like the software. And then there's also, I guess, like Arduino if you wanted to do like the control aspect of it. So, so you said that one of the issues couldn't get them to launch simultaneously, or at least simultaneously. Correct. Right. Have you considered such as hydraulics for like connecting wires for that? Um, that didn't work personally too much on like the controls aspect. We tried like direct wiring to like an Arduino master controller, I believe, but I don't think we could accomplish like perfect simultaneous. Like we were pretty close, but like even with like a slight delay, it still wouldn't cause like a complete flip because it would still be like disjointed then also with like each issue that came up how did you address it did you like start with because i know you listed like four or five did you start with like the motor first or did you start with structure or uh i believe we first started with like addressing the compression issue with the better battery and motor and then there was the biaxial compression to avoid the slam uh, the motor housing shake is still an ongoing issue. It still shakes a little bit, We're trying to find a way to like stabilize it. And then obviously, as before, the synchronous release. My last question. Well, they have a over play there. It also deals with some, some of these topics that you're talking about, where the wheels are able to like store energy and compress so it doesn't destroy the rover. Have you looked into stuff like that? Uh, specifically with only the wheels or like the entire structure? It was like the wheels. They weren't actually made out of mesh. Uh, was it? I don't know about like a structure where only the wheels were the mesh. Like the rovers that we were considering were mostly made of, of like a whole bunch of units just stacked on top of each other. Um, if it was just the wheels, as long as like the rest of the motor is also like durable enough, was it to like perform flips? 
Well, it's because when they were driving on the moon, bounce up and down above gravity, they just did damage the view. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, like, if you like looking into that. Not for that application in particular, because we were focusing on like flip designs. So if I were to like flip on the other end, then it would damage the instrument. But if it were to like just bounce with the wheels, then that would potentially work. Yeah, and it's almost for sure that what's being done now, I mean, because so the rover was built really in the like late 60s, right? So, and then hit the moon in the early 70s. So, so you know, with advances in materials and so on, it's almost for sure that, you know, Maybe not the specific work, but work like this is quite a significant extension of you know, what, what, what they had back then. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you. So, how did you connect multiple units together? Uh, so, that I didn't mention this in detail, but there are multiple different types of nodes. So, if you want like a single unit, we have like A nodes. If you want like a reversed unit, that would be B nodes. And then we also have like these double nodes, and those nodes are essentially like the connectors between the individuals. Yeah. All right, so next step, I start.